Welcome to Church in the Home. Welcome to those of you who have never seen my face on my television set yet. We love you. We're glad you joined together with us and we're sitting here with a group of people who join regularly with us here in Dallas, Texas. And we welcome each of you to this message. This is a message that the Lord raised up and gave to hungry hearts around the world as his final gospel. I don't think God will act or speak or do anything in these last days that is not connected with the message of the Apostle Paul. That's how important it is. That's why God gave it to Paul and said, you have a dispensation to carry out this message. You are the apostle for that dispensation. You have the message for this dispensation. And he has faithfully given us the message. Most Christians have not come to that message yet, at least in its purity. And our mission is to stick with the message, to get the message out so that people, when they hear it, will scratch their head and say, well, where have I been? You've been waiting for this message to reach you, and that's why we are so important here in Dallas and why every one of you watching this program now are so important that we spread this message God has given us to the ends of the earth. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, if you will... Take your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm talking these days about our commission. What is it God wants us to do? If you'll search Paul's epistles very closely, you will see that he has but one mission. That mission is to bring us into Christ and Christ into us. That's his mission. He's not building churches. Most of his ministry was in somebody's home. Most of the time that he ministered, he didn't get into churches. Usually when he went to a church, he had to have the policeman there to rescue him because it wasn't a good place for his message. A good place for the message, but not a, a good place to be able to continue on. They could have killed him in several times and at different places, but they didn't. God protected him and took care of him because he had a message. Jesus of Nazareth gave his <coughs> apostles and followers a message. At least five times in the scriptures, Jesus points them to their commission, what we call the Christian Commission. Not a good name for us now because the Christian Commission has radically changed. You understand that? There has been a radical change in the commission. At no place in the commission does grace call for healing of sick bodies, for casting out devils, for uh, miracles, signs, and wonders. doesn't call for that but has that. Those things work and those things still take place. I'm having as many people who are radically healed in the meetings now where I go and have for the last many years in Christian grace been healed. People been helped. People been set free. But that's not our calling. That's not our mission. Our mission is to tell people for the last time that there is a gospel that fits this period of time called the dispensation of grace. That's our mission. That's why we are called. And we are faithfully doing that. I must tell you, we are faithfully carrying out that commission. We won't stop. To the last breath I draw, to the last some of you in this room draw, it will still be this new commission given to us that comes through grace. Now don't leave here saying that he don't believe in healing. I do. I pray for every sick body I can and I pray for them in the framework of grace. I never pray for the sick anymore saying, God, you have to do this because you said you'd do it in the scriptures. Well, that takes us back to the law of scriptures. 
We're not in the law, so we can't say that sort of thing. We can't carry through on it. We've got to hold fast to what it is that is in Paul's message because he alone had the message for these closing days of time. And so I'm encouraging every one of you that hear me, I'll preach the second part of this Christian commission to grace people today. But up until now, this hasn't been the thing that motivates us. We have been motivated by the fact that Christ lives in us and how in the world can we carry him around and not say something about it? Well, when you say something about it, that's preaching the gospel. That's carrying the gospel. And you see, we have, we have a lot to learn about that, you and I. Because how can we talk to anybody and not mention Christ in us? How can I look anybody in the eye that's wanting to hear me say something unless I first say to them, it will not be me who speaks, it will be Christ who speaks as me. It will not be me who does this, it will be Christ who does this thing. I get it across to the car salesman and the people where I have to take the car in and get it fixed. I try to get it across to them. I get it across to the doctors. We're in that period of time where uh, Rod and I, Robbie and I have doctors, you know. But we let every one of them know that they cannot do anything to help us unless they yield themselves to Christ because he is the healer. Amen. And so that's our mission. That's our Christian commission. That's getting the word out. You don't have to tell them what God is doing. They've already got to fix what God is doing. But the way you stir people is tell them what happened to you. See, they can touch you, can't touch God. They can shake your hand. They can get tears in their eyes listening to you. Because it's that real. Intended to be that real. And so I'll finish this subject today, the Lord willing, if I ever get into it. Because I want you to know what our Christian commission is. I've already dealt with two points in the Christian commission. And all of the Christian commission, as I see it, and as many Bible scholars see it for grace people, is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And it begins at the 14th verse and goes through verse 21 at the end of the chapter. It is in these verses that there is the stipulation for what those who have Christ in them will do. They will do. You see, most people who hear the Christ life message don't really reason that it's any different from something else they've heard. When the facts are, when you got saved, God put Christ in you. He baptized you into Christ, into His life, into Him. And you can't get away from it. You can go through life and never mention that. Or you can go through life where nobody else ever mentions it. But these people will fall short of the glory of God. They'll make heaven probably if they're saved. But God wants children up there whom he had birthed. You see the difference between those two things? Going to a church and getting saved is a whole lot different than God rebirthing you. If you don't see that difference, then you need to start at point one. But in dealing with this message, we talked about two different areas. The first is rotated in verse 14. We discussed this, for the love of Christ constraineth us. What makes us go? What makes us go into all the world? The love, the love of God. I'm not under command to do it, but I am under the command of love. I love doing what God expects me to do, calls me to do, leads me to do, and whatever. That's the first thing. Point. Second point in verse 15 is that he died for all, that we who live should henceforth not live unto themselves, but unto him. We are never to live unto ourselves. We are never to do our selfish thing. 
We are to live unto him who is in us, penetrating through us with a light that is unbelievable. Today we're going to take up the third point, and the third point is found in, in verse uh, 16, which reads, Wherefore henceforth? Now, i got to stop right there, because there has to be a setting for this scripture. This is the most powerful scripture of identification to who we are and who Christ is, I know of. What does he say here? He starts off with two words that are going to explain the setting for this. Wherefore, henceforth. In other words, the wherefore states that this thing has been available. It's not just come up. It's not just in my latest vision. It's not just in my latest event with God. Wherefore, based on the first two points of the commission, Love, and henceforth we no longer live unto ourselves. Wherefore, or you could change it to therefore, therefore. Because there's some reason why we do this, why we have this particular verse 16. Wherefore, henceforth. Now, henceforth is a word that leads us into the doing of it here and now. It's never been done by Jesus of Nazareth. It's never been stated by a single person in the Old Testament. And it wasn't even stated by Paul until Jesus spoke to him and gave him this word in the 16th verse. Therefore, wherefore. Two words that help us to have a setting for it. Something new and different. Let's go on to the next line of it. Henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Let's just look at that broadly. When you talk to people, you should never talk to them outside of their flesh. You should never assume, for instance, that they know something or that they are somebody or that they're rich or that they're poor or needy. When you talk to somebody... You're not to know his flesh. Let me put it pointed. If you talk to any Jew that says he is a Judaistic person, he is not saved. He is not going to heaven. He's not a Christian. He's not even a good Old Testament Jew. Because right under his foot, these days of the cross where Jesus died under the cross God radically changed his plan radically there will be no one in heaven except those that are born again why because God elected because of what had happened in the Old Testament the great failure of humanity there that he would not bring up to heaven people he had to change again and again and again so what did he do he came up with his original thought. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. We'll get to that in a moment. He came up with Ephesians 1 and 4. Therefore, therefore, God has selected us, chosen us to be in Christ. So you can see the wherefore there. The wherefore is that this has always been in existence for God and Paul didn't know it and God just had given it to him and so he says, wherefore, therefore. Yeah? Wherefore, henceforth. I know no man after the flesh. I remember how I've been struck with this two or three times in my life. I'd be watching television with somebody, and maybe it was a singer, hillbilly, or western, or a southern singer, or anywhere, somebody that sung. 
And somebody there in the room would say, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if God had somebody like this in his plan? Have you ever been struck by that? Oh, if a person like that would get saved, how wonderful it would be. In grace, God has changed that. Grace is not something you stare at and have to take it or leave it. Grace is something that is finished. It will always be waiting for you if you want it. It's not coming and going. And so grace provides a different platform. When you talk to anybody or look to anybody for anything and you get to talking about Jesus, it doesn't matter who they are. You are not to know them in the flesh. You got it? Not in the flesh. In other words, don't look at the person and say, well, I think they'd make a good Christian. Better not. Don't listen to somebody and say, oh, I wish that person would turn to the Lord. Why? Because grace is a finished product, and if they are not interested in Jesus now, they may be later because the message will not change. The provisions will not change. They'll be the same. So you're not to judge people by the flesh. <coughs> and that's so even in, in, in the church house. You don't judge people there by the way they look, by what they, they may have said, said something very odd or strange. Don't judge them by that. Listen to what he says here. He says, those that are in this new Christian commission Henceforth know no man after the flesh. Why did Paul say that? Because anybody and everybody that accepts Jesus as their Savior has had their flesh dealt with. The moment they believe their flesh is dead to God. It's dead to God. He bore in his body our sins and transgressions. And so we're not to look at them as, as flesh. We're to look at them as people who need God. And as I've been saying, I've been solemnly struck because I never really thought this thought through, that Jews <laughs> being Jews cannot be saved. And when a Jew gets saved, he's no longer a Jew. Things that are plainly stated in the scripture, which we have a tendency to ignore. But if we look at people in the flesh, that doesn't change the message, and that doesn't change their invitation to the message. Because till the day of the rapture, till the minute of leaving this earth, these words will be important. They are not directed to flesh. They are directed to people who must be born again. Amen. See, cut out the frivolousness. It's cut out everybody's conjecture, their, their ideas about it. So the, next, the line says up till now, Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, Though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. What powerful words those are. What in the world could he possibly mean by that? Most people that I read after trying to get uh, their commentary on those words beat around the bush something awful like. I mean, they just go around and around in circles. And the time they get to us, the Greek and the Hebrew and the other things they know and have thought, you don't even care what they think about it. You're worn out. Because <laughs> they can't answer that. So let me give you a very simple answer for it. We don't even know Christ in the flesh. Why? When he was in the flesh, he had no message for us the Gentiles. 
His message was solely to the Jew. I have not come but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And Jesus himself, as I've often said, met Gentiles two or three times in his ministry. On two times, he called them dogs, which was the lowest thing he could ever call a human being. Jesus did that. So you see, the Gentiles was not a very welcome term in the plan of God as far as Israel was concerned. And to this day, they blame Gentiles for taking their place because God in Acts 28, 28 set them aside. He set them aside in obscurity. They are nothing anymore to the plan of God. Nothing. They will be in just a few years after Jesus comes. They'll come back into prominence, prominence and they will be born again and they will take over this world and get the nations of this world whom Israel was supposed to have reached in the kingdom message. And those nations that deny Israel that place, get this in your mind, this little nation over there that they're all fussing about now, wanting to bomb, wanting to get rid of, that nation is going to rule all these other nations in the, in the millennium. Think about it. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about we're not to know Jesus in the flesh. First reason is he came to minister to Jews. He had nothing to do with Gentiles. Another reason is that there's a new body. When Christ went back to heaven, he formed God through him formed a new body for believers. Something that had never happened on this earth before, but something that was related to Ephesians 1 and 4, chosen in Christ. He went back, and he no longer asked people to do what he expected them to do, and he used, preached the law with it. But now then, he formed a new body in which everybody that was saved or born again will fit into his body. What is the difference? His new body is not a fleshly body. It's a spiritual body. You'll be surprised how many good Christians today are following after Christ in his carnal not sinful, but carnal body. I'm sure that he had to eat once in a while. He got hungry. I'm sure he slept sometimes. He got sleepy. I'm sure he hurt sometimes. He was human. But that's not the body we're attached to. So we no longer know Jesus in the flesh. Because he has become a new body, a spiritual body, in which every person who accepts him as Savior is baptized into that body. Amen. It's hard for me to say that and say it now. We're not talking about water. I hope you get it so I never have to say that every time. <laughs> but that's what my Baptist friends believe. That's what many of my friends believe. They think that we've all been baptized in water or dipped in water or touched with water or something. But that isn't it. When the scripture said that we have been baptized into Christ, that meant that we have been placed in his spiritual body. Another point needs to be added to that. When you became a Christian, you were placed into a spiritual realm. You may not live like it. You may still live very carnal. You may be getting your eyes on everything that's done carnally in religion. You may try and be trying to build up your faith to have greater power yourself. But dear friends, there's a new body. 
There's a body that you have been placed in, and like a mother feeds an unborn child by her body, so does Christ feed and take care of us through his body. In him, we live and move and have our being. You can't even be a being as a Christian except in Christ. A mystery why they won't preach that. A mystery why multitudes of people keep going and listening to preachers who don't <laughs> preach the most common and the most often stated term in the whole of the Bible, in Christ. Isn't that funny? Nobody laughs here. That's how far they are off that the one thing God wanted Paul to know, Paul knew and he wrote explicitly. In Christ, in him, in whom. It's all being in him. So we know no man after the flesh. We don't even know Christ after his flesh. That's where this word comes in back in Verse 16, henceforth, we don't even know Jesus that way. Why is it we don't know Christ in the flesh? Our flesh hurts. Let's say we're dying with some disease. It never dawns on people who are saved that they have Christ living in them. It never comes to them. I've had many a dying person tell me, oh, I'm so glad you stepped into this room. You're going to be the answer to my life. And I've been over the bed and told them that the healer has been here all the time. I'd like to get you in touch with him. He lives in you. The provider lives in you. The supplier lives in you. He's in you right now. He's not coming and going. He's God's gift to you. <coughs> to make you who you are. <coughs> to make you who you are. So we don't even know Jesus in the flesh anymore. Why? Because he lives in us. He lives in us. He is our life. He's our substance. He's our everything. I don't know him as somebody that walks upon this earth and heals the sick and casts out devils and raises the dead. And Paul was given this message specifically. And he no longer preached those things that Jesus heals, Jesus conquers the devil, Jesus performs miracles. There was nobody in the scripture that had any more miracles than Paul had. Not even David starting at a young age throwing stones at Goliath. Nobody had. Nobody went through the trouble Paul went through preaching this message. And he was delivered out of everything that happened to him. When he died, there was nothing great that had happened to him. He was an old man and he died a natural, normal death. But until that time... Everything he had been through, and we'll talk about the five awful scriptures he gives us. Five of them. Five sets of them. About the hell he went through on this earth. But he was delivered every time. And when he got through, he never said, now folks, if you get the faith, if you get just enough faith, you'll be delivered too. Never one time does he say it. Why? To have stated those words would have been contrary to who that person is as a Christian. Right. It's contrary when somebody comes to me and says, listen, if you just had enough faith, you'd make all the things work. I would reject it openly. I would say, well, maybe I do need help, but I want to tell you something. I got Jesus living in me. What I need to know is more of Jesus. More of Jesus. 
You see, you see what it's about there? Knowing him. Knowing him. So, who are you? You sitting in this room, who are you? You claim to be a Christian? If you are a Christian, what are you? You're a Christ person. Because there's no other way God did it. God so speak in my carnal words, fed up with Old Testament saints. And even when he sent Jesus to this earth, Israel was still in bondage to another nation, to idols. He got fed up with it. And so on the cross, the magnificent, most wonderful thing that happened was God became cleared himself to do what he wanted to do with a human being. He would rebirth them. He would make Christ the seed. Christ the seed. Peter said it. Being born again, not of the corruptible seed. Get that out of your mind. What mom and dad did to bring you about no longer is important. What is important is the incorruptible seed, which is what you become when you accept Jesus as your Savior. Amen. See, I can't beat around the bush on some of these subjects. I like to get them out in the open. If I appear to be wrong, stand with me. I'm usually not wrong on some of these things because I've studied them for a good 40, 50 years. Ask for help everywhere I went. <coughs> I don't know Jesus in the flesh anymore. <coughs> I couldn't dare tell you that Jesus is walking in this room. He'll touch you. I used to say things like that. I used to talk about Jesus walking the streets of this city. He's trying to bring it under his control. Because that isn't so. He's not like that. He's not out in the open. He lives in human beings. You see what a strategic part of our message that is? And that these words he spoke here are not condemning words. You're not to know any other man in the flesh other than that he needs Jesus. That's what Paul's after here, that you get Jesus to him. You're not even to know Jesus in the flesh because that doesn't work anymore. That's not a part of the gospel anymore. The gospel is Christ lives in human beings. We live in him. We draw our resource and our life from Christ who is our temple, our tent, our dwelling place, our bodies. He is that. Christ is that. You know anybody that thinks you're Jesus? <coughs> you know anybody that thinks you are? I promise if you start telling people Jesus lives in me, some of them are going to call you Jesus. I don't want to hurt for a moment because they just don't know the gospel. They don't know that Christ is our life. They think, well, that's a very unusual thing, Christ being your life. Dear friend, I had another life called Satan. That didn't seem to be unusual to anybody. I've never had a life my own. Nowhere in God's word does a human being have a nature and a life of his own. He's either Satan or he's either of God. Jesus. That brings to my mind a little story. There's a businessman standing on a busy street corner one day and he was watching a little boy on crutches selling newspapers. And every once in a while somebody stopped and dropped money in his one free hand 
and he, with his other free hand, would reach under his crutch and, and bring out a paper. And the businessman was touched a bit by the faithfulness of this little boy selling newspapers. When all of a sudden, a guy came running down the street, and when he passed this little boy, his foot caught under his crutch and knocked him to the ground, and his newspapers spread all over the street. And he was crying. This businessman jumped to him, reached down, picked him up, put his crutch back under his arm, and went out in the street and gathered the newspapers and tucked them back together and handed it back to them, complete. The little boy with tears in his eyes paused for a moment, looked up, and said to him, Mr. Are you Jesus Christ? Are you Jesus? The man smiled and said, No, but I'm one who has Christ in him. Anybody call you Jesus? It's time that they begin to find out who you are. Who you are. I said I'd finish this, but I'm uh, moving awful slow. <clears throat> Most powerful verse in this Christian commission is verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, see it? In Christ. He is a new creature. Isn't that something? Paul never intended that people go around with Christ living in them and not be different creatures, a new creature. He never intended any other way. He said, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He doesn't give room for the fact that Christ could live in somebody and nobody ever know it. Why, if one of you, the night before you came to this meeting, had a great vision and the Lord showed you doing great and mighty things, and you came to this meeting, you couldn't help but get up and talk about it. But do you know what? He lives in you. You're in Christ. You're not separated from Him. You're not a different person from Him. You may think you are, you may have a serious mind problem that Christianity never meant anything to you, but Christianity is the only plan of God for people on this earth. Now listen to me. It is the only plan of God. There is not another religion that touches it. There is not a single pro progenitor of any religion that has ever existed that had a progenitor that died and came back to life. We got folks right here in Dallas, Texas that are, uh, had a healer that came along. The name slipped him right now, but he was, a, he was a good man, a great healer. I was on stage with him sometimes. But when he died, these people thought he was coming back to life. William Branham. And they're still believing that. Who? William Branham. Yeah, William Branham. William Brennan, there I got it. They think William's come back to life. Well, he's a fool if he lets anybody bring him back to life. He's a fool. Why in the world would he want to come back to this mess for a bunch of tear-stained faces and long tongues that talk about him, and glorify him, and lift him up? God took him. He's not coming back to life. There's no progenerator of any program that's religious that ever died and came back to life. Oh, we've had a bunch of almost. I've had two or three almost myself. Right down here in Waco. When I lived down there, I got a call one day to visit an old man that attended a lot of our meetings in the hospital. 
And they said he's at the point of death. Please get here and pray for him. Well, I got there. I prayed for him. He was out. I don't know whether he's alive or dead. He was out. And while I stood talking to the family, sure enough, the nurse came, pulled a sheet over his, over his head. He was dead. Well, I just felt led to go back up to the bedside and just watch it for a minute. And all of a sudden, the sheep begin to wiggle. <laughs> and sure enough, he was alive. That's an almost. <laughs> the facts are, you either are alive or you're dead. And no, no two ways about it. But I thought about how people glory in this sort of thing. If God takes you, you're better off than you ever was. New creatures. What are new creatures? They're offsprings of God. That's how Paul described us. He said we were offsprings of God. Well, our natural offsprings cause trouble. And sometimes the offsprings of God cause trouble. This goes in another message I'm thinking about. But I'll drop this one line here. If they've been rebirthed by that father, that never leaves them. Never leaves them. Well, you say, what if? I got no answers for what is. There will be a lot of people that are not what they ought to be. And I'll talk about this some other time. I got it in my thinking. But we're new creatures. We were not made for this world as a new creature. Scripture says that. We were made to go to the Father's house. Scripture says that. You were not made as a Christian to attend a church and to go along with that church and what they believe, that's all secondary. Okay, but it's secondary. You were made for the Father's house. You were made to live in it, and you're going to live in it. And he'd like for you to live in it with the information that he gives here in the scriptures. Wouldn't that be nice? And so the scripture says, any man be in Christ. He is a new creature. I've got more to say on this verse, but I think I'll wait. I had to get across to you especially what this verse 16 says about the flesh. Get it fixed in your mind. We're not serving the Jesus of the flesh anymore. That's Mary's production. We're studying God's production of his only begotten son. That's different. And with that, I'll stop. <laughs>